Do you really think this is going to be? How would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's not that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. I'm wearing feathers today because on October 4th, 2022, during a Kent with Bent, the chat met a donation goal, and so that means that the next video I made was with feathers. The last one where I was a dragon had already been promised, so this is the next one being made after that. Thank you very much to my audience for your enthusiasm and generosity. But we're here for Kurt. Kurt has just been telling us about the fossil record and how despite not at all fitting with a flood, it does anyway. He's about to tell us about how paleo currents show that maybe there was a flood. Too bad for Kurt, I've already gone over similar claims before, and even know where he's getting his information. So let's see what he has for us. And so when we see f these corals that we have to trace a long distance, we still find them in this burial site that's a long ways from wherever they came from, typically within a short distance of the equator. So what we seem to see is that consistently, if you can figure this out for a given fossil, if it's evident with a given fossil what climate it's normally living in, it's very frequently, most of the time, found in the same latitude as it, was, uh, it, it should have been growing in. Therefore what? The flood was sloshing east to west? Like what conclusion do we draw from this? This suggests that there is a current that is carrying the fossils, uh, the organisms that are going to become fossils, long distances, and it's following latitude lines. When you add that together with ed evidence from sedimentology of the direction of currents, you find that these fossils have actually been uh, transported long distances along latitude lines from the east to the west, consistently across this flood fossil uh, zone. Aha! Now I know what we're talking about. This idea comes from the aforementioned Arthur Chadwick, see last episode, who along with Leonard Brand and Mingham Wang collected paleocurrent data from around the world to create what, as far as I know, is still the most extensive data set on paleocurrents that exist. And it was published in Nature. So no, creationists are not excluded from publishing in major journals when they do good work. But there's a problem. After this was published, Chadwick used the data set to argue that during what he thinks of as the flood year, and what is actually basically the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, that there was a dominant flow direction which switched from west to east a few times. But the problem is, that's just not true. Paleocurrent data in Chadwick's own dataset don't actually show an unusual consistency in the flow direction of paleocurrents. I know, because both myself and Vice Rhino have crunched these numbers before. The Nature article is linked in the description, feel free to check. And given that I'm pretty sure that this is where this is coming from, and that we're not given examples of fossils being significantly displaced east to west, but not north to south, I now suspect that rather than basing this claim on actual fossils, Kurt Wise may actually be just saying that this prediction that one can draw from Chadwick's wrong conclusion is just already verified. But it's not. Another observation is that footprints are found in among these fossils. Which is on its own a problem for these layers being flood layers. Footprints can't be made in salt rock. They have to be in some kind of unlithified sediment. But there are two problems if this is a flood. The first is that if there's a flood and the sediment is soft, then the footprints are simply erased. Just think about footprints on the beach that you may have left behind beneath the high tide mark. When the tide comes in and out, they're just gone. Tide goes in, tide goes out. Never miscommunication. You can't explain that. And that's the effect of much milder ocean waves, never mind mega tsunamis and hypercanes. The answer could simply be that the sediments had turned to rock between being made and being covered by floodwaters. But the problem here is that this process isn't instantaneous. We know how long it takes for lithification to occur because we can see it happen. We also know that chemical reactions are involved and can test those under various conditions to see how fast they can happen. There simply isn't enough time in a year for this kind of lithification to occur. So whatever we're about to hear, I'll bet it's not an explanation for how footprints could even occur under a flood. And really, I need to be clear about this. This is the kind of nonsense that a quick trip to the beach can defeat. This isn't some highbrow ivory tower theoretical work here. And uh, there's two characteristics that are common with these characteristics. First, that they're found in, or were formed in, water. Yes and no. Some were indeed formed under some depth of water. Some were formed in simply damp sediment. 
Water is important for the formation of tracks because it helps the sediment stick together to form a coherent and stable track. Again, going back to the beach, if you walk in the completely dry sand, you leave prints, but not ones that have a clear impression of your feet or shoes. But once you step into the damp sand, suddenly your prints are clear. But if you step into flowing water, your steps are immediately eroded by the water itself. So we do have prints from below water. In fact, we even have some preserving different swimming gates and dinosaurs. But in order for this to happen, the water has to be reasonably still, or, like at the beach, the marks will simply be washed away. And further, as I've noted before, we have tracks from the desert of the Coconino Sandstone that were definitely not made under a body of water, but rather in damp sand during a rainfall. And how do we know that? Well, because the raindrop impressions are still there. You know what happens when a raindrop hits the surface of a body of water? It just adds to the depth of the water. Not, ex not an exposed in the atmosphere. Except, you know, for the ones that were, which is most of them. Most were formed with water present, but still above water. And secondly, that the footprints are found below the body fossils. So, for example, here we've got some footprints uh, in a sandstone in the Grand Canyon. Uh, the, there's a little bit of an outline of the little guy. It's, a, it's basically a, it's a labyrinthodont footprint, a type of amphibian. Uh, you've got several of them here, one, two, three, four. There's the trackway of the little fella. Uh, and the direction of trackway is indicated by those prints that I pointed out. But the individual prints are actually faced at a slightly different angle than the trackway is. So he seems to be walking kind of cockeyed to the direction of the, of the trail, uh, which suggests that there is a current of water. Water is moving along and pushing him. Or the animal was just walking uphill, which, you know, has been the consensus since at least 1979, and remains the consensus today for the very good reason that the Coconino sandstone is composed of cross-bedding of the angles characteristic of wind-borne sand dunes, not submarine sand dunes. The only person I'm aware of who has managed to report numbers consistent with waterborne dunes is Andrew Snelling, and no one can seem to reproduce his results. And since we already know he's willing to simply blatantly lie to people's faces, I don't trust him to not lie in his papers. And this is on top of the fact that, remember, there are preserved raindrops in the Coconino sandstone. So, yeah, we can be very confident that this animal was going up a dune, not against a current. This is probably not in wind, situations. It's got to be in water. Well, I agree that it's probably not wind, but it's also not water. By the way, I'm going with the assumption that these are from the Coconino Sandstone because that's a part of the Grand Canyon that is known for lots of tracks. And according to the geologists I usually consult with, it looks like Coconino Sandstone with some desert varnish. So it was probably exposed to the air for a while before it was found. If it turns out that that's not what it is, then I'll have to go back and reassess. But as it stands now, I'm reasonably confident that this is indeed from the Coconino. Especially since this particular animal is a very low-lying animal. So the evidence is that there must be a water current that is causing him to put his, his feet, orient his feet, uh, upstream so that he doesn't slide away, so that he isn't washed away. What would that evidence be? because things other than currents can make animals walk with their feet pointing in the direction of the force being applied. Significantly, gravity can do it. I like that we're not even seeming to bother to discuss the actual conclusion that has been reached by real scientists. And that's one of the things about AIG. They do the bare minimum to pretend to be real scientists to casual observers who don't know too much about the science they're misrepresenting. But if you dig even a little bit under the surface, you realize that they're barely a step above Eric Dubé's 100 proofs that the Earth is not a globe. 200 proofs Earth is not a spinning ball by Eric Dubé. 4. Rivers run down to sea level, finding the easiest course, north, south, east, west, and all other intermediary directions over the Earth at the same time. If Earth were truly a spinning ball, then many of these rivers would be impossibly flowing uphill, for example, the Mississippi, in its 3,000 miles, would have to ascend 11 miles before reaching the Gulf of Mexico. But that's what happens when you start with an obviously incorrect conclusion, like that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, or that the Earth is flat. You have to be either ignorant or dishonest to support those ideas. Now, I think most creationists are on the ignorant side, but I know some of them are not, because 
they have the education to know better. And then make his way across the current at an angle. From this, we can determine the direction of current, the type of current that uh, animals had experienced. If we look at dinosaur prints, for example, we find that the quality of the dinosaur prints uh, suggests that they were formed underwater. Oh, hey, look, Paluxy tracks. At least he's not pulling a Hogan and saying that some of them are human tracks, when in fact they are actually ornithomimid tracks. And they were indeed formed under shallow water, probably in the intertidal zone of a shoreline. One hint of this is that there are preserved ripples and the footprints clearly eroded while the sediment was still unlithified. It's also been observed for a very long time that uh, dinosaur prints seem to lack tail drags. You've got the prints of the dinosaurs, but you rarely get a drag of a tail. You know, because dinosaurs held their tail off the ground. In fact, to get the tail to contact the ground anywhere but the very tip, you generally would have to sever the spine, which, you know, animals tend to avoid as a habit. I have seen a couple tra tail drags. One, the one I'm, uh, I've, I've seen actually in person in the field is, uh, is one where it's clear that the animal threw his tail down as he was falling because then it's followed by a body print. Exactly, you only get tail drags in unusual circumstances because dinosaurs weren't tail draggers. And we've known this for like 50 years. Usually, however, the tail is not on the ground. Uh, it's not preserved. So it either suggests that dinosaurs always kept their tails above the ground. Which they did. In fact, they have extensive ligaments going between the transverse processes to keep the tails off the ground and most probably physically couldn't have their tails drag while standing without significant effort and rearing up so that the spine was near vertical, rather than the horizontal posture of almost all dinosaurs. Which seems a little odd. No, what seems odd is that a grown man presenting himself as a science educator apparently doesn't know the basics of dinosaur anatomy, despite acting like he does. Or, they're being, the footprints are being deposited in water and the tails are being suspended by the water. I think the evidence is for the latter. Then they would have had to have been lighter than water. But we have no reason to think that they were. We have dinosaur tails preserved with the remains of soft tissue as impressions. They weren't fatty, they were full of bone, ligament, and muscle. Dinosaur tails would have been at best only lightly buoyant and probably would have been negatively buoyant, and so would have sunk. There's no reason to expect tail drags to be common for dinosaur tracks in the first place. And no reason to think that only being in water prevents this. Once again, why is this just begging the question? Uh, which suggests that most dinosaur prints are actually made underwater. It does nothing of the sort. And I like how he shows us a picture of Coelophysis definitely not dragging its tail. Furthermore, a second observation with footprints is when you find a given organism in the fossil record, typically you'll find his footprints before you find his body fossils, before you find his bones, or before you find his shells. For example, when you first find trilobites in the fossil record at the base of the Cambrian, the very oldest rocks that contain animal fossils, you don't find the shells of the trilobites, you find the footprints, what's called Cruziana. In the lower left there, we have a picture of Cruziana footprints. They're the, the little trackways that the little guys make. You have to go up the stratigraphic column some distance, in some cases, um, several dozens of feet to finally get the first uh, shells. And these shells are made of calcium carbonate. I mean, these shells are pretty, pretty solid. They're made of limestone. Trilobites show up in body fossils in stage three of the Cambrian, so about 520 million years ago, give or take. The first Cruziana ichnofossils do indeed predate that significantly, but the problem is that Cruziana aren't only made by trilobites. They're also made by other organisms like some worms that have limbs. So on its own, Cruziana is a bad way to detect the presence of trilobites unless other impressions or body fossils are found. It should be easy to preserve them if they were there. It is, and they probably weren't. And Cruziana on its own is insufficient to determine if trilobites are present. Yet, what we have are footprints that occur for a number of layers before we finally get the bodies. That's a big old citation needed for me. Same thing happens with the dinosaurs. The very oldest evidence we have of dinosaurs are footprints. It isn't until later that we get the bones. Now, this claim actually has some merit. There might be as much as 12 million years between the first dinosaur tracks and the first body fossils of dinosaurs. But there's a difference here between trilobites and dinosaurs. 
Trilobites are basically fossil factories. Their shells were calcified, and so were basically rock, and they shed their shells many times during a lifetime, so each shed can produce a new fossil, potentially. That's why their fossils are so abundant that you can buy them at a rock shop for like a buck. Dinosaurs don't shed their bones, and their bones are less solid than trilobite shell anyway, and so we're already less likely to fossilize. Additionally, marine creatures like trilobites tended to live exactly where fossilization is most likely, at the bottom of sediment-filled, usually shallow seas. The first dinosaurs lived in Pangaea, which was basically a desert with low rates of sedimentation because the land was so vast that not much precipitation or even wind made it to the interior. Basically the worst place for fossils. Not that we don't have Triassic fossils. We do, it's just that they usually tend to be in places like modern Arizona and New Mexico that were on the coast of Pangaea. But another thing is that over a dinosaur's lifetime, it can leave millions of footprints, but only one skeleton. So it's honestly not surprising that far more numerous footprints are found before the vastly less numerous skeletons. But also, I don't know if this trend is actually found in a wide range of organisms. Kurt has only mentioned trilobites and dinosaurs, and he's probably wrong about one. So at best we can say dinosaur tracks predate dinosaur body fossils, and that's it. To say that this is a trend, he would have to show good evidence of this happening elsewhere in the supposed flood rocks. It would seem, in the face of it, that it would be easier to preserve bones than it would be to preserve footprints, but the fossil record shows footprints before bones. I would suggest that what this is uh, referring to is that uh, organisms are escaping from a catastrophe. They're running for their life while uh, sedimentation is occurring very rapidly. So you see their escape trackways before you finally get their bodies at a, a, a higher level. Except that that kind of rapid sedimentation wouldn't preserve ichnofossils at all. So that can't be what happened, and this whole argument is a non-starter, even if it be true that the tracks of organisms are consistently found below their body fossils. So the footprints that are formed underwater and formed before the uh, body fossils suggest that we have both terrestrial and marine organisms overwhelmed by this catastrophe, which is consistent with the global flood we have mentioned in scripture. It would be if those things were true and floods didn't destroy trace fossils like footprints and burrows. Another issue is the issue of disparity before diversity and stasis before abrupt appearance. The difference between disparity and diversity. Diversity is the number of organisms that you have. It's how many different species you have. Disparity is how different those species are. In an evolutionary perspective of things, uh, organisms, in fact, change through time according to an evolutionary tree. They, new species come in slightly different than species that were already there, gradually branching out, gradually becoming more and more different from the original species. Remember, that's part of the AIG narrative too, because they fully accept evolution as a process that produced the species within what they imagined to be separate kinds. So in order to create great disparity or difference among and between organisms, you have to actually branch a number of times before you can get there. Nope, that's how you create diversity, that is, large numbers of species. A single species can evolve significantly without ever branching into a new species if there is consistent directional selection and the population never have the opportunity to found new populations that then form new species. For example, it is likely that the three species of the genus Thalassochnus or the aquatic sloths, are in fact what is known as a chrono species. That is, they represent the same population evolving through time rather than splitting into new species that may coexist. Now, branching usually does come with changing morphology at the same time, but the two things do not have to be related, even if they often are. On the way, you're increasing the number of species. So it should be that you cannot produce, in evolutionary theory, great disparity before you've already produced great diversity. Uh, no. <laughs> so as Stephen Jay Gould and others have said, with evolution you would expect diversity to appear before disparity in the fossil record, but alas what fossils show over and over again is high disparity at the beginning long before we get any diversity. Well, you can't have any disparity without some diversity, because in order to have disparity, you have to have more than one species. And that right there 
is diversity. For example, the oldest um, uh, arthropods, some of the oldest arthropods in the world are found in the Burgess Shale. Beautiful preservation, so, so well preserved that you can actually dissect the individuals uh, as fossils with their internal parts. It's just extraordinary stuff. It is extraordinary, and it's also well understood how it happened. And while the sedimentation of the shale can be described as rapid, it is not described as catastrophically deposited in any works by actual scientists that I can find. I have, however, linked the most cited work on the preservation of the Burgess Shale fossils I could find, Mechanisms for Burgess Shale Type Preservation by Robert R. Gaines et al. In the Burgess Shale, if you set aside the trilobites, there are 21 species of arthropods that, are, that have been described, and they represent 20 different classes of the phylum Arthropoda. So the major groups of arthropods, that's the highest classification of arthropods, at the first, basically the first level that you find arthropods at all, you find 20 different classes. There are only five classes of arthropods in the present. Ah, but you see, in the Cambrian, a class didn't mean what it would mean now. So arthropoda is a phylum, and it depends on how you count, but it is generally thought to have under it groupings of various ranks, including subphyla, superclasses, and classes, the number of which is in fact a bit up for debate, as what a class is is fundamentally arbitrary. But let's take a look at some very different arthropods around today, the spider and the bumblebee. In terms of evolutionary biology, current estimates say that these two shared a common ancestor about 520 million years ago, and so are quite distinct. Now the bumblebee is a mandibulate, while the spider is a chelicerate, which is the deepest divide in crown arthropods. So let's take a look at the base of this tree, with the ancient crustacean Cascalus ravitus. It was about 430 million years old, and this is Sanctacaris uncata, a chelicerate. It's about 500 million years old, so about 70 million years between them, and about 90 million years from the common ancestor of the two to the younger of them, C. ravitus. They look fairly similar, and with good reason, they're more closely related than a modern spider and a bumblebee are, even though their common ancestor with each other is the same as the common ancestor of the bee and the spider. If you wanted to see two modern arthropods that are about as related as C. ravitus and S. uncata, you could look at the red fire ant, Solenopsis invecta, and the electric ant, or little fire ant, Wasmania oropunctata. And that's right, both of them are ants. Both are even fire ants. In fact, they're in the same subfamily, Myrmicinae. It's only because now, hundreds of millions of years later, chelicerates and mandibulates have changed so much that we see them as radically different. In the actual Cambrian, the diversity was not anomalous, and if you looked at the chelicerates and mandibulates 400 million years ago, you might even put them in the same family. That's 120 million years after their common ancestor, which is about how long ants have been around. And they're all in one family. In fact, the only reason we can put these in different subphyla at all is because of what we know about their evolution. Without that information, Wise here wouldn't see that big difference that he imagines on the basis of modern examples of these groups. Once again, you scratch the surface of this claim just a little and it stops making sense almost immediately. And there's only 21 species representing 20 different classes. That's huge disparity. That's more disparity than you in fact have in the present arthropods and they're represented by only one more species than there is a disparity. Except that no, it's not. Because we're talking about so long ago, any splits in the family tree will look huge to us now. In fact, let's use a tree as an analogy. This tree's trunk split early on, and now two massive trunks grow from that point, each further splitting into other branches, subbranches, twigs, and finally leaves. This might seem like a big difference to you now, for a leaf to be connected to one trunk or the other. But think about when the split happened. It was probably the first split in the tree's life, and it was probably a very small tree. At that point, it was just a tiny little division at the top of a small plant. No big deal. It's only now, after probably decades, that it seems like such a major division in the tree. It's the same with evolution. Right after groups split, there's barely any difference at all, even if the now split groups go on to found what we now call classes. Right there at the base, they were sister species, as related to each other as wolves and coyotes, or bobcats and lynxes. That is not what you'd expect in evolutionary theory. No, it's exactly what we'd expect in evolutionary theory. We should see, early on, the emergence of what today are widely separated groups. What other option would there be? If evolution were true, should new groups just not evolve? That's basically the opposite of evolution. 
The problem is that Wise is confusing disparity as we see it today with disparity as it was in the same groups when they first started evolving. It's a bait and switch game. He then goes on to say the same thing about echinoderms as he just did about arthropods. I'm not going to repeat myself because my counter is literally the same. So I'm skipping that bit. But I would suggest that the observation of disparity before diversity fits a flood account because if the flood is coming in and let's say picking up entire ecosystems and carrying them and burying them which we know it couldn't have but that's okay when it picks up an ecosystem the ecosystem has a very high dis disparity it has trees let's say it's a, an, a, a terrestrial ecosystem it has trees and it has uh, it has insects and it has, let's say, mammals and it's got fish in the little streams and it's got bacteria and it's got, it's got a very high disparity. Compared to the diversity of the world, it's got a very low di dis diversity. So it's got very high di disparity, the full disparity of life, and yet a relatively low diversity. Oh, all those things that are way more disparate than his examples of arthropods and echinoderms from the Cambrian. It's almost like we're seeing exactly what we'd expect if evolution were true. But if the flood is picking up animals and dumping them in sediment, like he says, then where's that Cambrian bunny? Also, why aren't fossils graded by hydrological means? Shouldn't the bitty trilobites sink slower than big lumbering bears? And why shouldn't tiny little Agnurignathus have managed to fly around with the birds found in the upper layers? Instead, it's gone by the Cretaceous, but birds are there? What happened? So if the flood picked up a community and dumped it in place, the first community it laid in would in fact have very high disparity with relatively low diversity. It's exactly what the fossil record shows. On the issue of organismal change, evolution in fact uh, predicts gradual change of one organism to another. So if your A is going to evolve into B and C, you would expect a series of transitions between A and B and A and C. And it would expect that the divergence could be seen between B and C as things go up in the, in the fossil record. What fossils actually show, though, is not this gradual change in divergence. Fossils show stasis and abrupt appearance, as Stephen Jay Gould used to describe it. Around the species level, sure, they usually do, but I've already talked about great fossil sequences for aquatic sloths and ceratopsians, but how about the sequence for horses, whales, or humans? Those show nicely smooth morphological change as you go up in the rocks forward in time, and closer to the modern members of those groups. Now, you might object that those are post-flood, but hey, if horses can evolve that much after the flood, I don't see why animals in the past couldn't either, whether we have the intermediate forms or not, and, of course, the ceratopsians aren't post-flood, nor are they the only fossil sequence we have. It's just that they're a particularly flashy and complete one, and I like dinosaurs. Uh, stasis means that when you find a particular species in the record at one level, the first, the oldest one you've got, it stays the same. You find the same species throughout its entire range, and then it disappears. You don't find the species changing at all. Uh, it is in stasis. Couple things. Let's introduce to the channel, once again, stabilizing selection. When a species is about as fit as it reasonably can be in an environment, then of course that means that any significant change is going to be harmful. So natural selection acts to keep a species morphologically stable over time. But we also have examples of species indeed changing under the influence of directional selection. For example, bison antiquus was the direct ancestor of bison bison. The black vulture has fossil forms that were larger and had different beak shapes as you go into the past. Similarly, the species of condor in the fossil record are probably chronospecies. Now, why is there a bias towards recent groups when looking for these smooth transitions? Is it because evolution was different in the past? Well, probably not. As I've already mentioned in this series, older ages are going to have a smaller percentage of the rocks that formed at the time still around because erosion is a thing, and always has been. Further, while smooth transitions over tens of thousands to millions of years do happen, Gould was at least somewhat right that punctuated equilibrium is correct. You see, while the majority of a population of organisms may stay in the environment to which they are well adapted, sometimes smaller breakaway populations may enter new environments, or changes to an environment, such as a new mountain range or river, may break a segment of the population off. This new segment is going to be heavily affected by not only new selection pressures, but also the founder effect and genetic drift. 
The founder effect is simply that if you take a small segment of a large population, their genetic diversity as a group will not be the same statistically as that of the larger population. Genetic drift is the non-selection change in allele frequencies just to do with random chance. Basically, which chromosomes just happen to end up in the particular sperm and egg that go on to make a new individual. Or it can also be the result of relatively random events that call part of the population. So for instance, if you have flowers, it might just so happen that a wildflower kills more of the blue flowers than the red flowers, just by chance. Next generation is going to have more red flowers. Combined, this means that even without changes in the selection, the daughter population will look significantly different from the parent population after a while. Taken together, this small population is likely to change relatively rapidly until they are reasonably well adapted to their new habitat. In the fossil record, this would look like the stable existence of the parent population, and then at some point the sudden appearance of a similar but distinct species without a smooth transition between them, because the transition was swift and only a small percentage of animals are ever fossilized, and then the fossils survive and are found. That is why at the species level, transitional fossils are rare, but not unheard of, while at larger levels they are actually quite common. In fact, here's a bunch of them again. <laughs> And when you first find the species, there's no transition evident in the fossils from any other species. Except, you know, when there is. So it's sudden appearance and then stasis through time. And it's not just true of species, as Stephen Jay Gould argued, it's actually also true of every taxonomic uh, level. Oh cool, except we already saw it wasn't true for the family Equidae, the suborder of Ceratopsia, and the phylum Arthropoda. I guess Dr. Wise is just lying to us. But hey, look at the unranked clade Pantestudines, which is basically the stem and crown root turtles. There is Unotosaurus, then later we find Odontokelis, and still later Proganokelis. And even later there's Ningemis, which is still not a crown turtle. Now I would say this is certainly not something predicted by evolutionary theory, but it is expected by a, with a flood. Okay, so evolution predicts that we should find transitional forms at various taxonomic levels. A flood predicts that we should not. I have already shown numerous transitional fossils, but you know, here's the slideshow again. <laughs> So I guess that's the flood falsified. Of course, Dr. Wise will come up with some post hoc reason to reject literally anything as transitional unless it's in the Cenozoic, but that's because you gotta lie to Gek. Or 
just not know. Because if in fact you have a world already full of organisms, and you, you uh, take that world and dump it into the fossil record, every time the fossil record in that sense has sampled from the world, let's say it's sampling dogs, it comes and samples a dog and buries him here, and then samples, buries him here and here and here. Since it's all from the same species, because they all lived at the same time, sh they should not change up through the record. That's true, which is why it's weird that the first dogs we find are Hesperocyonids and not modern canines. But we also have Borophagines between the Hesperocyonids and the Holocene. Of course, there were literally no canines in the supposed flood record, which is odd, isn't it? Where do they live that they weren't preserved at all in flood layers? But they're all over the post-flood layers. Be that's that would you would expect stasis with a flood model. Also, what's the likelihood that the first time you picked up that dog, there would be any other fossils that had just been laid down that look like you're transitioning into a dog? That would be extremely improbable, if not impossible altogether. Well then, I guess since Meosis exists and it's transitioning into a dog and it's in the fossil record, that's another win for evolution. So, the disparity before diversity, the stasis and abrupt appearance, which is very common among organisms, suggests that we have what is called a global life assemblage. It's called that? By whom? Because when I searched for that phrase, literally zero results came up. I think the only person who calls it that is Kurt here. It's a living group of organisms, living communities, living, uh, living ecosystems and biomes across the world that are picked up suddenly in a flood and dumped and buried. So you've got the high disparity with low diversity from such a living assemblage. Except that, you know, we don't have oddly high disparity because Kurt Wise is presenting a straw man of how taxonomy works in the framework of evolutionary biology. Basically, this whole bit he's doing here comes down to, now you see, if I just pretend the fossil record isn't what it actually is, and that evolution doesn't work the way that it's thought to by scientists, then I can say it was a flood, and not deep time and evolution that caused the fossil record. And yes, if you say things that aren't true about the fossil record, you can reach a conclusion that also isn't true. You've got the uh, stasis and abrupt appearance uh, from, uh, from the same thing. So we have evidence of... Uh, so far, a uh, catastrophe, rapid burial. Catastrophes of various kinds, yes. A global, single, watery catastrophe? Absolutely not. That's precluded entirely by the data. Strong east-west current, global flood, and global life assemblage. Strong east-west flow? Nope. Chadwick's data do not support that conclusion. I've checked myself. Global flood? Still a no. Global life assemblage is just a made-up term that doesn't mean anything and isn't used by anyone else but Wise, as far as I can tell. But with that, I think we'll leave Dr. Wise for next time. We're going to continue with how the flood allegedly explained the fossils, despite being soundly refuted by them, next time. If you liked this video, please tell me in the comments what you liked, and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit dislike, and tell me why you didn't like it. Either way, please subscribe, and hit the bell icon, and turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I release new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur, and this is my favorite audience on YouTube. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mavity Babity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get an access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos, and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out.